Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a planning board uh, of February 12th. Uh, Chair Curry is out of state today and asked me to chip in. Uh, before we get started, I'd ask you all to r rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Is a roll call? I will do it. Thank you. Um, okay. Roll call, please. John Curry. Vicki Gannon? Here. Nancy Garbino? Here. Jean Goldenberg? Dennis McNamara? Here. Bruce Prince? And Chris Saberta? Pending. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, as I said, we're going to change the agenda slightly and do number five first. The, uh, <clears throat> what? Point of order, you have to explain we don't have a quorum. In the I, I, okay, fine. I, <clears throat> The, um, we're doing that because at the moment we do not have a quorum and cannot take any decisions without a quorum. The last item on the agenda is a discussion item only. We can do that without a quorum. Thank you. Therefore, we're taking number five first. Um, we have received correspondence from a former member of this board, Mr. Foley, uh, Christopher Foley, regarding uh, service along Route 35 uh, cell service along Route 35, and he asked us to look into it or discuss it. We're here for that discussion. If Mr. Foley would like to explain where and what he he's encountering, we can perhaps answer. Thank you, uh, Mr. McNamara, uh, members of the board. Thank you for so promptly um, placing, placing my item, uh, this item, on the agenda. Um, I corresponded with the board about a year ago and again more recently in reference to um, what I characterized in both letters as a, a drop off, a degradation of cell phone service along the Route 35 corridor, roughly between um, Lasden Park and Van Rensselaer. Um, two towers were constructed approximately a decade ago to solve that problem. Um, one is um, just east of the Emmawak Dam, the Santa Roni property. The other is on the bluff behind um, the Muscoot Inn across, the, across Route 100 from uh, 7-Eleven, the uh, Amato property, I believe we called it. Anyhow, um, as with all cell tower projects, there is a trade-off. Um, there's a balancing. Uh, in this case, the town um, gave up some of its view shed gave up some uh, damage to aesthetics, uh, which is a particularly uh, difficult thing to wrestle with in terms of the tower, the Amato Tower at the corner of Routes 135. Nevertheless, we gave it up, and we gave it up in exchange for something. Uh, to borrow a phrase from recent politics, there was a quid pro quo. And what the town was to receive in exchange for what we gave up uh, was um, seamless service, at least from the provider that sponsored it, and that was AT&T at the time. Um, I'm here to inform the board, and I'm sure there are others. I can't speak for, um, for those that have carriers other than AT&T, but I've been told anecdotally that they experience similar drop-offs. I'm here to say that the service has uh, suffered drastically in the past 12 to 18 months. It's gotten worse. Um, I'm not an engineer. And I'm not a telecommunications expert. I have no idea why that would be. But the net result is that uh, the service that I believe we bargained for and that we um, gave up to some extent our aesthetics for is not functioning. Um, the other thing about cell phone towers, at least in the town of Somers, is that every, they, they exist pursuant to special use permits, which uh, have to be renewed uh, twice every 10 years, so every five years. Um, the, I'm informed by Surrett through her memo that the Santoroni 
tower is due to be renewed for special permit reapplication <laughs> in September of this year. So it's a, a timely um, occasion to be looking into this. Um, the last thing I'll say is that there was some mention in that memo of the Zoning Board of Appeals having jurisdiction over special use <laughs> permits in this area. And indeed, um, the two towers in question were last had their special use permits last renewed by the Zoning Board of Appeals. I think that was improper. I, I think my cursory review of the town code uh, informs me that it is the Somers Planning Board yeah. that has exclusive jurisdiction over special use permits in this area. So I would, I would urge you to take a look at that. Um, <clears throat> what's done is done, but in terms of these permits that are coming up, I do believe it's this board and this board alone that has jurisdiction and, and that should take that good hard look. Okay. So that's all I wanted to say. I know you have a lot of folks and, and a, a number of other issues uh, to tackle tonight. And I see you have your quorum now with the addition yeah, of uh, the fourth member. Let the record show that we have a quorum now. Welcome. Thank you. And my apologies for being late, everyone. Some issues of mine. So Unless the board has questions, so I'll ask. Uh, so Chris, I, Chris I, go ahead. Okay. I, I, uh, I'm just going to give a little history. Probably, oh, 25 years ago, I got myself a Blackberry, <laughs> and, it, and it was uh, Singular, which is a predecessor of AT&T. And until I retired, I had that Blackberry, and uh, I, too, commuted across Route 35 every day. There has always been a dead spot on Route 35. And it is in and around the Lasden Park ever since, I don't know, it became part of this county property. Uh, I'm not an engineer. I can't diagnose what the issues are. I'm not aware of any degradation in the last 12 months. Um, I no longer have a Blackberry. I now have an iPhone. Um, there's still a lack of service in and around Glasden Park, from Wood Street to Van Rensselaer. The Amato Tower clearly won't service that area because of topography. The, uh, uh, what is it? The yeah, Cobbling Rock development stands hundreds of feet in the air, blocking that tower from sight, light of sight. The Santa Roni, uh, 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 tower uh, should provide some service, but something else is going on there. Mm. And it's been going on for 25 or 30 years, and I don't know what it is. Uh, I'm not an engineer, and I can't answer scientifically what the differences are. Nor do I think this board has any jurisdiction over the uh, engineering capabilities of the towers. We're here for site plan approval, to put a tower in a particular site and do it in an environmentally sensitive manner. That's, I think, the, the scope of our jurisdiction unless well, the town attorney or town engineer has a different viewpoint. I think that is generally true, and you will all be very much aware of the fact that the approval and review of these towers has largely been taken out of the hands of local boards uh, because it's been determined to be uh, federally, uh, the, the federal government's been interested enough in it to ensure that this service is provided. But therein lies the hook, I think, that Mr. Foley is asking us to take a look at, and that is that there is a trade-off that kind of ease of approval that they that that industry was was promised <laughs> was because they made promises about what they were going to provide and as part of their of their presentations when they come in which are largely pro forma there's not much we can do about their site plans and and you know their their technology but as part of it they do come in and present coverage um, you know, they tell you what that quid pro quo is going to be. Here's what we're going to give your town. The renewal process, which we've become, I think, better and a little more diligent about lately, does, I think, give this board an opportunity to at least ask these folks to come in with a new chart and, and explain what's going on, if anything, and what the challenges are to see whether they can be met 
by the industry, by them in particular, or is it some failure of what they're doing? I agree also with Mr. Foley that generally speaking, it would be this board that would, that would hear those renewals. And the only reason I can think of that that would not be true is if in a particular approval resolution for some specific reason, uh, there was some departure from that process. So that I can't really speak to, but I do think it's something that the board would at least hear and could, and could you know, put them through some paces on yeah. uh, in the renewal process. Yeah, so that, that's what I was going to ask is, is that um, really the way I can see doing this is once the, we get the renewal comes in, we, we could ask, we've had an issue, we could ask what did you promise and what did, what's actually out there and have them give us a report on that. You know, I haven't looked at those maps in a very long time. Mm. I don't remember what they promised for that region, for that area of town, for example. Right. Um, you know, and, and so I think that that would be a logical step to do. And then we can always ask for other other technology. The challenge is, the person coming in to renew the tower doesn't own any of the equipment on it, right? Right. That's the challenge. Right. Is if it's an AT and T issue, we're not going to have yeah. an AT and T in front of us. We're going to have a tower owner in front of us. But so that which, becomes a which is why I, which is why I want those renewals put together. Yeah, yeah. But I and, and, really want, and I don't know who does it, whether it's the town board or what. Those two, those renewals, the the tower and the and the users right. have got to come in together. The co-locators, et cetera. One of the things that these that the renewal um, procedure does often highlight, though, is I mean, look, this is an industry that knows that knows its business. Coverage is good. Somebody will fill that gap if you identify that issue, and so it's still worth doing. And I would say too that I think we've had issues before with whether or not these people when they need renewals actually come in for their renewals and i think we've got the right if the time if the clock is ticking on it i think we've got the right to bring them in too yeah. so we should take a look at what that time period is sometimes they're they're late right and so i think the two is what did you promise us what are, what are we getting number one and number two is if we're getting what they promised us and it's just not what we thought it was going to be, or it has degraded over time. I think we, we could ask them for other other technologies that are available, like a repeater technology that they can put on top of a, a well, you know a pole or something. What's going to happen? What's going to happen when they go to G five? Five G, the tower, the, these towers now have a range of three to five miles. Yeah, five G that gets much smaller. Mm. It's less than a mile. Yeah. How many how many towers are we going to have around town? Well, every pole's going to have a tower on it. Yeah. Or is there going to be different technology? Does it wind up going on telephone poles? Well, it's yeah, ultra yeah. high frequency. The, the 5G is ultra high frequency, so which is another issue. So, so Chris, does that make sense to you from your from you know your view um, to take that step that I just outlined? Yeah. The only thing I would add is it, perhaps not wait for the applicant to come to us with their renewal application. Give them a little heads up that that. This is an issue that has been identified by the board, and we'd like them, at the very least, to be prepared to address it in their application, if not sooner, else the whole thing gets backed up. You know, yeah. if we yeah. blindside them at that point, you know, it, it's out here. We're we're six or heck, we're seven months in advance. Uh, you know, let let the uh, to the extent well, we certainly we have the information. We know who owns the towers. Right. Let them know um, if, if they can speak to it. And if the if the board is so inclined I can work with Surrett on such of a, of, see, of a letter. It's, why don't we try to see if we, as a part of that process the testing of the capabilities be independent third of, party yeah independent third party testing of the of the capabilities of the, of the service I think didn't that come up in some constraint on the, the last oh, that, one yeah. that we renewed? And, and it was, did the third party tester, were they licensed to right. sign off yeah. on their, yeah. their right. forms as engineers in New York? I would also say that um, Surrett's memo notes that the um, CEPs, uh, special exception use permits, are granted by the ZBA on these two. Have you reached out to the ZBA? Have I reached out to the yeah. ZBA? No, uh, in line with my comments earlier, I, I, I don't think the special use permits for cell towers are within the purview, purview of the, uh, the ZBA. They're not. Our yeah. code, our code well, is code clear. They have been at one point. That's why I said That's what's what occurred in the past has occurred. We can't change it. But so it was I'm, improper. I'm wondering why I, I can't speak to that. She... Well, she, she was echoing, per her memo, she was echoing some advice that she received from the town attorney. 
Um, my point is, I read the town code. It's, it's this board that should be involved in vetting and approving or disapproving a special use permits in this area. I'll follow up with Roland on that particular yeah. point and have one of us will get back to the board on that. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> it changed after, it was about, to, it was in between <clears throat> the Baldwin Place and the Somers Commons was right in there that the change happened yeah. between those two towers. Right, right. It was probably four years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Four or five more, years ago? More than that. I think longer, longer than that. that. So it was longer than that. It was probably more like 12 years ago. No, that no, I was here. It yeah, hasn't right. been that long. I've been here for 10 years, so it, was, it happened in that time period. It was before Basil Segos became in charge. Uh, it had to do with environmental review and who had the authority to conduct it. Okay. We'll go back to our regular agenda. First item now is to permit application for the renewal, removal of Dean's Bridge Road, a uh, Dean's Bridge, sorry, not the road. Um, <laughs> notices. Yes. The legal notice was published in the Summer's Record on January 30th, 2020, and the adjoining property owners were notified via mail on January 27th, 2020, and the sign stating the date and location of the public hearing was posted on the site on January 23rd, 2020. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'd like to open the public hearing and ask the applicant to make a brief presentation. <clears throat> Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for having us here today. I'm Jeff Bussey. I'm DEP's accountable manager in charge of design. Uh, with me here tonight is Ron Roman from Hardesty and Hanover. They're our design consultants. And Virginia, uh, Virginia Victoria Carpenter uh, with NTech, who's in charge of our permitting. Uh, so Ron is going to give a little overview of our project. Okay. Good evening, folks. Uh, as Jeff Bussey mentioned, my name is Ron Roman with Hardesty in Hanover. We're the design consultant for the removal of the Dean's Bridge uh, here in the town of Summers. And actually, part of it is in the town of North Salem. Over the last several months, we've been coordinating with both agencies, planning boards, uh, different review agencies, submitted the uh, state, federal, as well as local permit applications for removal of this particular bridge. For the folks in the room who may not know the structure, it's at the end of uh, Dean's Road. It's actually where the uh, road actually used to cross over the reservoir and actually go over the Metro North Railroad and tie it into Route 22 or, or Hard Scrabble Road, as someone referred to. Uh, our goal for this particular project is to remove the entire superstructure with partial substructure removal, re-landscaping the area uh, so it appears as natural shoreline. Uh, most of this uh, work will be taking place from the west side of the uh, project to, uh, to constraints with Metro North Railroad, not allowing access across their features. Therefore, uh, the construction will take place through the town of Summers. Uh, we are proposing to reutilize some of the granite stones uh, in post-construction conditions, as well as uh, clean the stones. And also, uh, we'll have appropriate signage once the road is closed, and also have a, uh, a bollard, removable type bollard, at the end of the uh, project limits within uh, both the sides of the town of North Salem and the town of Summers. Um, basically, the project uh, will include sustainability credits. We're actually recycling the bridge decks on this particular bridge. That'll go to an artificial reef program out in the ocean. The rest of the structure will actually be recycled. The concrete will also be recycled. Uh, the structure does have some, uh, we did some testing on the materials at this particular site. They do contain uh, lead, which uh, our recycler will take the uh, necessary steel with the lead uh, attached as well. Uh, we've been dealing with the New York City DEP for uh, the necessary landscape requirements as well for revegetating the site. Uh, so we're actually removing approximately 17 trees in this location and putting back approximately 26 post-construction. Um, we've also reached out and prepared the necessary SWIP documentation that's been approved already by New York City DEP. So those are some of the parameters uh, where the project stands today. We're seeking um, 
the final resolution, if you will, for the removal of Dean's Bridge. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, we have, uh, we're in receipt of two memoranda, one from uh, resident Maureen Devine and another one from uh, a neighbor, Janet Wilkins. In both cases, they're strongly um, opposed to, and I happen to agree, the, the creation of a passive uh, recreational area at the end of the Dean's Bridge. Uh, there was some conversation earlier about bird watching in park benches and other passive recreational uses for that property. Uh, I'm afraid um, it might likely be more used for teenage drinking. And I just, for one, would not want to encourage that. Um, I, I, I am for, uh, personally, uh, this application, but that one aspect of it bothers me. Other board members? I've already uh, spoken. Um, I am a member of the Audubon Society, but I'm absolutely opposed to uh, this uh, recreational uh, suggestion made by the Open Space Committee uh, for bird watching <clears throat> and the passive uses. Um, uh, just using different words, I totally agree with uh, uh, the chairman. I think that I've, I've commented similarly. I think there's probably liability issues even on the sidewalk. All of our cars stacking up there and trying to turn around right, right in there, you could see it was hazardous. I think it just delays the project and puts an undue burden on the community, so I'm not in favor of it. I don't have much comment. Uh, I, uh, all the information that's been received from this board is all uh, against any sort of potential redevelopment uh, in this site uh, after it's demolished, which is really what this public hearing is about, more mm -hmm. so than anything that may go past that. Um, and if I had received more feedback from folks besides the one committee and the one person on the committee about turning this into some sort of recreational facility, I might uh, be more of an advocate towards that. But uh, considering the opinion of the residents in that vicinity and others, I think we should stick with what's on the agenda, which is the uh, removal of the bridge and talk about its uh, nuances to that and how we're going to do that safely. There is a concern about the lead, and I think that that's something that the residents should really now at this point dive deep into and make sure that uh, all of the fail safes are going to be instilled uh, on this project to ensure that there's safety to the environment and to, and to those that live in that vicinity, probably more so than building a park bench at this point. Um, I mean, maybe it's something that can be revisited later, but uh, at this point and at this juncture, it is of my opinion that we should just continue with the uh, hearing as it regards to, as it uh, relates to uh, the removal of the bridge and nothing else but that. Chairman, if I may, I'll just, just for the clarity for the public, um, the application that came in uh, from um, the DEP for this project was really just for the removal of the bridge, removal of this bridge. Um, it was via the, content, the discussion at the Open Space Committee in the memo that this concept of a recreational area emerged, and we had, we had conversations about it during the site walk, um, and you've heard the board's perspective. There was subsequent meetings that we've had where we contemplated and we asked the applicant, can you do this, right? If the, if the board chose, can we move in this direction? And there was a long conversation about, well, that's going to take time, and it's, gonna, it's a big process at the DEP, and the board was contemplating whether we put in a, in, in a requirement as a condition of approval that would require them to come back at some point in time to do that recreational area in the event the planning board preferred that direction. Obviously, you can hear from four members of the planning board that it does not look like that will be a condition of approval. I just wanted to make it clear that it is not something that is part of the application now. It was something that was contemplated as being added. And we, you've heard what the board had said. I just wanted to clarify that for the public. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, is there a diagram to put up there of the site? Uh, yes, we do have a, a board we can put up. Because um, I have a question. Sorry, last time we presented a PowerPoint 
Uh, so okay. that's why we just Understand. have a, a board that's here. Fine. And if you can just, when you do it, just tilt the board just a little bit so we can see. Okay. Because we're all proud at this end. I think the public will be on this. I think the public will be able to help me. Mm -hmm. Let's get the right Oh, God. Slight rotation toward us. Okay. Uh, my, well, my question is, yeah. and I don't think that diagram helps me. Um, <laughs> Dean's Bridge. Yes. Road. Yes. Goes across the bridge. It's a town road. I want to know how many feet of that road is on city property. On the west side, you have about 900 feet. 900 west, feet? West of the bridge to the New York State Electric and Gas right of way. You also have a New York City DEP recreational boat facility about 280 feet west of the bridge. So, so what you're telling me is 900 feet of Dean's Bridge from the edge of the bridge, coming back towards town, 900 feet linear measurement? Plus or minus. Is on, not on town property. It's on city property. It's on city property. Is that going to be removed? No. Why? Because when we have the uh, New York State Electric and Gas still has to have uh, access to the roadway. You also have to have, uh, there's a recreational boat facility down about three, uh, 280 feet from the bridge. So uh, also for the snow plow storage facility down there as well, when you plow the streets, that's where basically uh, the town is now stockpiling the snow at the end of the road. Uh, that also is the area where um, you can see that's the greatest turnaround area that's currently there. If you actually go to widen the road, et cetera, cul-de-sacs, then you would have environmental issues affecting potential wetlands, tree cuttings, etc. So the town is providing the roadway for non-town facilitations. I'm sorry? The town is providing a roadway for non-town facilities. Is that, was that correct? It's yes. not, it's not yeah. town But there's property. no magic about it. I mean, that, that does not necessarily need to be a paved road, right? I mean, it could be a gravel road, right? Well, to accommodate depend, those uses? It depends on the final outcome. I mean, if you go through and actually put a gravel road there, ultimately you have to maintain it, right? Unless you do vegetation mat or something to that effect so you don't have the earth and, you know, but the weeds growing up and then you have a forested area in five years, right? So there's a maintenance issue there. Um, also, you know, if you do remove that, uh, roadway, then you have the potential for invasive species to, to vegetate. So you'd have to also look at the landscaping uh, details and revisit those. And also, this project is near the 100% uh, completion as far as permitting. Uh, so we'd have to revisit the permits and uh, reapply for the state and federal as well as the local uh, permitting due to soil disturbance. Okay, but the, you're saying the use of the road would be the electric utilities and uh, boaters? Recreational permit holders. Joe, did, I, block just, did I just I, understand I don't want to the take. applicant to say no. that the town is yeah. pushing snow down towards the water? That's what I. That's what I heard. Is there a, a mm. concern with that? I made a note of it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I wasn't aware of that. I saw him writing. That's yeah. yeah, that's <laughs> that was an interesting. What, what, what we're yeah. really missing here, um, I'm asking these questions because we don't have the highway superintendent here. This is his road. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't want to prolong this, but actually, I think um, I would be opposed to closing the hearing. I'm not interested in prolonging the application, but I, I have other concerns about this road and about nuisance. We have two letters here, and there's something that hasn't been discussed, that there are nuisances that go on on that road. I don't want to say anything more specific than that. <clears throat> and we're the planning board. Um, I don't think it falls within our, mm -hmm. in our purview. It's a town board purview. But this nuisance being brought to our attention, something else has been brought to my attention that relates to this, 
as a result of Mr. Foley being here. We have dead areas in town for cell phones. One of them is Route 35, and the other is mm -hmm. the end of Dean's Bridge Road. The end of Dean's Bridge Road. <laughs> and one of the nuisances that has been described to us um, are people using that dead end road for illicit purposes. And um, what I read in the Wall Street Journal is that the government <clears throat> has recently bought the ability to follow cell phones so they can keep track of undocumented, th th that's the alleged reason they've done it, but they've acquired this ability to follow cell phones, any cell phone. Supposedly it's for undocumented purposes. Well, one reason someone would go to that dead end road is because there's no cell phone coverage. So they can carry out their illicit affairs in places like that. <laughs> Something to think about. Okay. And that's why I'm interested in why are we maintaining a road in a, an area that we're not servicing anymore. And that, you know, I think those are all very valid concerns. Um, and I'm not sure if that's going to fall on us to address. Uh, uh, and it I, shouldn't be. But yeah, my suggestion would be with some of these uh, nuisances that are being reported uh, in that vicinity, that uh, the, the, those that live in that area and any residents that live in other parts of Somers can go in front of the town board and express that. Yes. And I think that's probably a better um, venue in order, you know, for you to discuss those issues that are there. Absolutely. Um, we're here to discuss the removal of the Dean's Bridge uh, and the, all of the processes and site safeties that involve that stuff. Um, the 900 feet of road with the town, and you're right, that's definitely a highway supervisor's yep. uh, purview, and I, and I think that that's something that uh, should be addressed. I mean, we could probably send a memo to the town board regarding some of the information that's come up at this meeting with the concerns of the town residents about what goes on, um, and that memo can be distributed to Chief Driscoll and, and to others, and that the, you know, our town police can probably pay attention to that. Um, but I, I don't want to tie up DEP's Absolutely project uh, to try not. to get this road. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you, that's definitely a safety issue uh, and a security issue that we should address, but it's unfortunately not, not here. Yeah, I, so. I guess we're, we we're, can, we're all on the same page. Absolutely. Yeah, we're trying, and trying and, and, and I want to help the residents that are yeah. having issues our, by directing them towards the right. But we don't want to lose sight of what we learned. Exactly. Right. And, and within our belly, like, if there was a way of restricting the use of the road, as part of this approval, but apparently not. I, I mean, I, I don't know if DEP, uh, it's not their road to restrict. It's the, the, the reservoir is theirs, the property and the right of way around it is theirs. That's my understanding of all of this. And please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and then I'm sure that there's, on a legal sense, there's these right of ways that allow NYSEG to use the road and a town to use the road on top of DEP property. So it's, uh, I really would like to just sort of stay focused on the bridge part okay. and getting that taken out because it is a hazard. Uh, and again, concerning to me, and that's something that we do discuss is the lead abatement that's gonna come from this and ensuring that that's done in a safe manner so that our residents aren't exposed unnecessarily to airborne lead contamination. Okay, let me, let me just go then. Is there anyone in the pub, uh, public wishes to be uh, speak on this? Come. Excuse me, sir. Uh, you can, yeah, thank you. <coughs> and you can please give us your name for the record. Thank you. Uh, Eugene Wolerska, I live on, seven, I live on uh, uh, Karina Drive. And I went to see the bridge, as a matter of fact, yesterday. Uh, just to walk down the road and stuff like that. Uh, and yes, it is a nuisance there, primarily. Uh, you can, uh, quite a few beer cans down there and stuff like that. In any case. Uh, uh, and and a treadmill. This is a new a, a new addition. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, having said that, the question is. Healthy beer drinkers. Uh, uh, the, uh, having said that, uh, uh, what is the timeline involved once the project starts? Once the bridge starts coming down, uh, that's question one. And then, uh, 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 is there going to be a discussion as to uh, will the road? What will happen to, uh, to the road primarily? 
uh, and the concern here on my part is with a dead end, it's already uh, an attractor. Uh, will it even remain a bigger attractor and stuff like that? That, that was our discussion. That was our discussion. And, and we will, although we can't do anything about it, uh, we could recommend to the town board and the highway department to look into it much further. Do you, uh, would you enlighten us into how you plan to cordon off the end of the road once the bridge is done? I know we, we've had some discussions at the site right. that the public may not have been <laughs> present for right. so that the residents get an idea of, of once the bridge is gone, what prevents someone from driving into the reservoir? Sure. Uh, basically, once the bridge is removed, uh, there's going to be about 60 feet of pavement removal on the west side within the town uh, limits here. Uh, the site would be actually regraded uh, for a stable slope and actually revegetated. So ultimately, within a, say two to five years, it looked like natural forest, uh, the shoreline, uh, to mitigate vehicular traffic from uh, going down and going into the reservoir, basically. Uh, there would be uh, multiple signs meeting New York State DOT MUDCA standards to show that the road is closed uh, in multiple locations. And then ultimately at the end of the road, with those discussions with the board, we originally had a New York State DOT concrete barrier there uh, across the roadway. However, uh, something more aesthetically pleasing, we opted for uh, bollards, removable bollards, as per the request of the town. So those uh, bollards will be installed uh, down at the end of the road where the road would terminate and then turn into a natural forested area, if you will. And, and for those that don't know, what's a bollard exactly? A bollard is basically a, a steel tube that has a, a covering over, a, a aesthetically uh, architectural pleasing cover uh, also would be uh, partially or would be fully removable uh, for as per the town's request. Uh, it's set in uh, basically concrete and uh, keyed into uh, a sleeve in the concrete. And then basically the bollard would be uh, dropped in and locked in uh, to basically mitigate or prohibit uh, vehicular traffic um, from going down the roadway. And, and just to be clear, that would be at that 60 foot mark? That's approximately 60 feet back from the, uh, from the existing, from the existing uh, uh, joint, if you will, the bridge. Yeah. I think the resident also asked about timing of construction. I know that was discussed in the <coughs> meetings. If you could recap that. For sure. Us. Basically, once uh, notice proceed is given, this is one bridge out of a, a collection of three for a particular contract, which one of the other ones coming up is Plumbrook. Uh, the anticipated construction shoveling grounds about six months to remove this. Uh, once the contractor actually gets on site and gets it out there, the total overall construction duration is 18 to 24 months for the entire project because it does include two other structures. Okay. Anyone else wishes to be heard? Okay. Board, uh, what's your, no one else wishing to be heard, we can close the public hearing. Is there a motion to do so? I don't think there's anything, any. Nancy? I don't think there's anything here. I think uh, I'll make a motion to close it. I second the motion to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I think what we can do is we can allow the public to submit um, any further mm -hmm. comments in writing um, of 10 business days, which we usually do. So we have yeah, I was going to suggest that then we, uh, we ask the town staff to prepare a resolution um, and that uh, any additional comments, can, written comments, can be received or postmarked within 10 days of today to be included in, in the, the, uh, the final documents. Okay. So one of the Thank things you. that for the applicant um, would be great is if we can to eliminate some conditions on, um, I know I think this little landscaping plan we're waiting on, right? There's Correct. a couple things. The more things we can get taken care of, the better before, you know, we vote on the resolution. Sure, absolutely. The, um, we didn't submit those yet, just pending tonight's uh, you okay. know, public hearing. So once we receive the final uh, you know, <laughs> questions, et cetera, we can certainly submit the materials we have. As I mentioned before, we're about 90 to 100%, almost rounding 100% on this contract. So we have that information available. All right, great. And I think okay. for the other issues, Joe, you'll reach out to the highway Yeah, I've got, I've got three items. One is the landscaping plan. The other is I just wanted to close the loop on the road removal. We talked about 900 feet. 60 of it is going to be removed that still leaves does the board want me to pursue that with the applicant or are we comfortable with this there are benefits to a firm surface um agreed yeah 
you know, there are benefits to a firm surface, some of them articulated by the applicant, but there's also benefits to removing well, surfaces. Well, removal or gating it further back, but allowing, uh, see, I guess, I guess the gating problem is uh, you're depriving uh, residents, uh, users of the reservoir, the boaters. Well, we, I don't think you would be able to gate it. You'd, you'd have to, um, it would be 280 feet. That 280 foot mark would be the gated area if we were going to get to that point. Um, I, I, I think a lot of the concerns that are voiced uh, has to do with uh, safety and security in that, in that area. Yeah. And, uh, and, I, and I agree with that, that that's, a, that's an issue. And I think that that's something that the town board should be aware of. And I think that that should be delegated to the agencies within the town that are that are responsible for that, for the time being, until we can uh, see how this progresses and 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 see what happens. We'll get some more feedback within the 10-day period from the town residents, um, and then and see if we can work it from there. Because I, I do agree that there are benefits to keeping a, uh, a hard surface like that, especially with the trucks that have to come through there for right of ways for. Um, NYSEG and, right. and, and, the, and the town, you know, for, all, for other purposes, and the yeah. recreational facility the that's already and the there. And the boat access. Right, yeah. right exactly. So. And then the last item is, of course, on the snow storage. I'll coordinate with the, with the highway superintendent on that. Right, so the two um, communications that we got from residents should be forwarded to the town, and then any subsequent that come in in the next 10 days also go to the town board. As you said, yeah. for, for their... Yeah, yeah, if it's related yeah. to okay. a safety, yeah, well, security... Well, these two are already issues. sent. They've already got them, okay. And plus our comments. But if any others come in, yes, they're shared. Very good, okay. Did you have another comment? No, another comment. Does the fire department use that to pump water? Can they do? I'm not aware, but I'll, I'll I mean, I'll it, there is a, uh, a term called drafting. I was a former firefighter, so it's possible uh with the front suction on on the on the engines but i don't know if that's the protocol they've here been notified in the town they've been notified if that was their location to pump yeah. for their pumpers they would be here I'll yeah they didn't you. they didn't know they, they don't didn't miss provide anything it. Yeah. yeah i mean in a pinch you probably could but i don't think it's like a set location i, I i've seen uh, drafting drafting hydrants that are hookups that will really just sink into a, a body of water with a filter on the end of it and then now you can draw the water out from that um that is to my knowledge is not present on any of the dep reservoirs mm -hmm. but fire trucks come with something similar where if someone's house close to the coastline was burning they could draft the water out if need be but again i i, I haven't done this in a long time so <laughs> i don't know if we have the equipment to actually make that happen <clears throat> Okay. Great. All set. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, application for a removal of the Plum Brook Bridge. This is a second public hearing, or a separate public hearing. Um, I guess we'll open a notice. Yes. The legal notice was published in the Summer's Record on January 30th, 2020. Adjoining, adjoining property owners were notified via mail on January 27, 2020, and the sign stating the date and location of the public hearing was posted on the site on January 23, 2020. Thank you. Okay, open the public hearing and ask the applicant once again to give a brief overview. Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, Ron Roman still from Hardesty in Hanover. Uh, we're working on this project as well with New York City DEP. This application is actually for the removal of the Plumbrook Bridge M between routes 100 and 138 for the, uh, over the spit of land over the Muscute Reservoir there. Uh, this bridge is, uh, again, uh, almost a century old, has reached its service life uh, due to structural deterioration. This bridge was actually closed in 1998 due, uh, for vehicular traffic. Uh, again, it's a, a basically a pin die bar uh, truss. It's non-redundant, uh, so if you lose a pin, basically the structure uh, would collapse. Uh, we're seeking tonight to remove the bridge, just like Dean's. This particular bridge, the decks will be actually uh, donated under a sustainability program for DEP's uh, Zero Landfill Initiative, uh, actually the uh, artificial reef in Long Island, once again. The steel will be also recycled, the concrete will be recycled, and the uh, granite pylons will be actually, as well as the capstones, will be stored on site. Um, for the future use. Um, basically, again, this particular roadway uh, will be removed partially 
uh, and then also uh, re-landscaped with a partial uh, substructure removal as well. So it's going to be a full superstructure removal, partial substructure removal, and then uh, regrading and landscaping of the site to once again revegetate it um, for this particular uh, area. Well, you mentioned removal of the road. I mean, they were replacing that bridge in the future, so that removal is very limited, right? Yes, it's basically where the abutments uh, behind the wing walls from the uh, joint back to the edge of the wing walls, basically to allow for the uh, removal of the wing wall itself and then also allow for the regrading and stabilization of the area. Great, thank yes. you. And there's also uh, New York uh, State Electric and Gas overhead lines, basically a 13.8 uh, kilovolt line, I believe. Those overhead, uh, New York State Electric and Gas has already relocated those poles for this project, raised them from a 40-foot pole to a 55-foot uh, tall pole to allow the contractor to uh, for swing operations and demolition in this case. You're all set. That, that would be done beforehand. <laughs> yeah. okay. It's already done. Good. Okay. Um, any board comments on this? I, I, I have no concerns with this one at all. No, I assume that the replacement news is no different than it was when you last represented it. No, that's correct. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, that's correct. Okay. Joe, you don't have any. Uh, I don't have any. I was just going to remind the board of that matter, right? There was, the, you know, I think the, the, you know, the the concerns that we've heard from the board up to this point are not relative to the removal, but more with the schedule for the replacement. Correct. Yes. And we went through and we talked about um, requiring, as a condition of approval, them to uh, the applicant to look at different alternatives to replace the bridge. Some of which may be able, we may be able to expedite, including some old designs that were done, we talked about even in the past, right? So one of the conditions of approval will mandate that, that the applicant be back in front of this board with replacement options that can expedite and shorten that time frame, um, because this is a critical uh, access route, emergency access route, and uh, um, an egress route, specifically mm -hmm. from the church. So um, it's really important, I think, that we expedite this, and the board has been quite clear on that, and we'll, that'll be a condition of the approval. In addition to being a requirement in the New York City Charter, among other things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anyone from the public wish to be heard on this? No one wishing to be heard. Uh, is there a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Uh, staff prepare a resolution. Okay. Done. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Okay. Next item is uh, Bluestone Peak Academy. This is a site plan and subdivision public hearing. And I want I need to acknowledge distribution of to the public of the final project assessment EAF Part Three to all interested and involved agencies by the applicant having been approved for distribution by the town board as lead agency under seeker. Um, this document is available for public viewing at the townhouse planning and engineering office and on the town website. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Mark Weingarten. I'm a partner in the law firm of Del Bello, Dinellen, Weingarten, Wise, and Wiedeker. And it's my pleasure to be here this evening representing 294 Route 100 LLC and its agent, Sebastian Capital, the landlord, together with the school, now known as Bluestone Peak Academy, in connection with their request for site plan, preliminary subdivision, and other related sundry approvals to enable the development of a world-class for-profit boarding and day STEM STEAM high school, grades 9 to 12, on the property located at 294 Route 100, formerly known as the IBM campus. I'm joined tonight by our engineer, uh, Rich Williams, who you'll hear from shortly, our planner, Bonnie Von Olsen, and our architect, Eric Kyer. Uh, as you uh, are all aware, um, uh, we have petitioned for proposed zoning changes in connection with this before the town board. Uh, currently, the property is OB100, and uh, if our changes are approved, it will permit the school use on approximately 345 of the 723 total site acreage uh, on the property. 
We have worked hard to preserve and reuse the campus as much as possible. And as you are also aware, the only new building that we are proposing is the field house, and we are adding some playing fields. Other than that, all of the activities of the school will be housed within the existing buildings. Otherwise, um, we have also petitioned, in addition to the zoning changes, and made all of our environmental submissions, which are before the town board and currently pending as they are the lead agency, uh, and it remains under review. We have submitted our site plan and also, as I mentioned, requested uh, preliminary subdivision approval. We met with you informally on November 13, 2019. We received feedback from your board. On January 29, we submitted our amended site plan, which was in response to comments uh, from your board, from a memo of your planning director dated December 27, and from comments contained in a memo from your engineer, Woodard and Curran, dated January 3rd, 2020. We have now received comments on our January 29 amended submission in a memo from your director of planning dated February 6, 2020, and another comment memo from your engineer, Woodard and Curran, dated February 7, 2020. We have been told to keep our presentation this evening short, as you, we have shown you, I think, this presentation five or six times as we've gone through it. What I'd propose to do now is to turn it over to Rich, have him briefly take you through the subdivision and site plan that is before you, and then, of course, we'd be here to, and our team is here to answer any questions that you may have. We understand tonight is the opening of the public hearing, and, of course, we're also here, not only here for you, but for the first time to hear from the public with respect to these this portion of the approvals that we are seeking. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. Rich Williams, Insight Engineering. So as Mark said, we have two processes running in parallel, one with the town board as lead agency, who is looking at the overview of the project, and then right now the phase one site plan, associated environmental permits, and the subdivision with your board. Um, I do have all the phases and all the boards with me tonight in case questions come up, but I'm going to focus tonight just on phase one in the subdivision. Um, what I do want to mention about all three phases is while the town board is studying the overall impacts associated with all three, we will be coming back before this board seeking approval for phase two and phase three. Our goal right now is to open the private school in the summer of 2021 with fall of 2021 being the first academic year. While the school is open, we'll be permitting phases two and three with this board to then expand in 2022 and 2023, at which point we'll have hopefully the full population at the school. Right now before you is a subdivision application, which will subdivide the property into four parcels. Located centrally in the site is the school parcel. Um, we will also be creating a utility parcel which will contain the facilities yards, which has the existing wastewater treatment plant and water treatment facility. And then the leftover parcels will be a northern parcel and a southern parcel, of which there is no development planned or contemplated at this time. Uh, just to briefly walk the board and the public through the plan that I brought with me. On this aerial drawing, you can see the Muscoot Reservoir. North is to my right, your left. Um, you can see 684. We have New York State Route 138, it's intersection with Route 100. The hamlet of Somers is in this part of the drawing, and you have Route 116 here. Uh, the red lines are the proposed subdivision lines. The blue lines are the outer boundary of the parcel, which is approximately 723.1 acres. And you can see we have the utility parcel located off of Route 100, the central parcel for the school, and then the northern and the southern lots. Okay. All of our phase one improvements are located on what I call the school lot or lot one, which is located centrally in the site. Mm -hmm. And I'll walk the board and the public through what those are. The majority of the work we're going to, going to be doing in phase one is renovating existing buildings. Again, this is an adaptive reuse. There will be one new building constructed, which is a field house. And then beyond that, 
the majority of the program for the balance of this phase and the future phases is eliminating parking and impervious surfaces to construct fields. At its peak, IBM had to move 4,000 people in and out of this campus twice a day. Um, we have a population that's about half of that, uh, most of which is boarding. So we don't need the amount of parking they had. There was approximately 3,100 parking spaces on site. We're going to be cutting out about two-thirds of that by the time we hit phase three, leaving about 1,000 parking spaces. So what are we going to do with those parking lots? We're going to convert them to fields. This will help with stormwater runoff, water quality, chloride issues, which I'm sure will come up this evening and we'll talk about in a little bit. But specifically, the renovations in phase one are going to be to the central services building. And just to get everyone oriented, we're looking at the center part of that school lot there's an existing loop road that circles the campus with an entrance that leads to 138, 116, which is off this page, and Route 100, which is off this page. The Central Services building is located generally in the center of the loop. We're going to repurpose that building for auditorium spaces, administrative spaces, cafeteria space. And then we're going to focus on the two northern buildings, converting those into dormitories um, and classrooms. The field house we've been mentioning is going to be located just west of the Central Services building. In order to treat stormwater runoff from that building, because it is a new impervious surface, we'll have an underground infiltration system. Other improvements in phase one consist of constructing uh, two baseball fields in the northern portion of the site, eliminating parking lots just east of OB3 to construct a softball field and two multi-use fields. I do want to point out since your last submission, we did lengthen these multi-use fields to conform with boys lacrosse, um, the NHS standards or the National High School standards. Boys lacrosse has a slightly longer requirement than the co-ed field. We had previously shown co-ed fields, but in order to meet the boys standards, we did lengthen those. We're also going to repurpose uh, existing parking lots in the southwest corner of the property, turning them into tennis courts. Um, there is a net reduction in impervious surfaces. However, to meet DEP requirements, we do have what's considered new impervious surfaces there as well, which is any new surface created which is currently lawn or woods or a non-impervious surface. So we have an infiltration basin being constructed. Um, we have a series of improvements in front of the building just to spruce up the landscaping and revitalize it and, and freshen it up. We also have a new access road alignment in order to accommodate the fields and again associated stormwater treatment. Um, not visible we'll be on this plan but we'll be constructing three drone pads throughout the site. These are small circular asphalt pads six foot uh, radius um, for flying and landing drones as part of the STEAM program. Um, we for phase one we're going to operate within the existing water and wastewater permit limits so we don't need to modify that. Part of our recent submission is we provided uh, an analysis of the existing wastewater treatment plant facility and also included in there a startup program. Um, and I think that really summarizes the majority of the improvements. By the time we're done with phase three, one net benefit is there's going to be a 20% uh, reduction in impervious surfaces at the site or just over 10 acres, which when you talk about adapting, adaptively reusing a property, I think is a win for stormwater in the environment. Okay. And, and, and simply just for informational purposes, uh, we've been informed, I know there's been a request by this board and others for a presentation by the members of the school to discuss things that are really outside the environmental review process, which is going to talk about campus life and student life and health care and all, all of the things of how the school is going to operate. That's going to be scheduled on March 12, we're told, which will be the same night as the town board public hearing. And the school will be coming, making a presentation that evening. We got a, uh, that information from the supervisor, so we thought we'd share that March with you 12? tonight as well. No, March, 12. March 12, Thursday night, March 12. at <laughs> 7 o'clock, I believe it is. But I'm sure you'll be getting an official notice of it. Thank so you. that is our presentation. And of course, we're here to answer any questions that you may have this evening. <coughs> Oops. Nancy, while you're looking for your card, did you find it? Yes, I did. Okay, go ahead. No, no, it's all right. Go ahead. So I was just going to show you, just I know we're going to enter into some public comment here. I just want to make sure that everybody understands where we're at. Um, 
the applicant just represented um, that there's a town process, right, the town board process that is the overall project. That's the zone change. That's the overall use of the school. That's why you're going to see that presentation at the town board of what is the comprehensive school, all phases, phase one through three, what is this going to be, and that's the impacts that we're studying at the town board as part of that zoning process. So there's a, a public process and an environmental review process that is happening at the town board level for the entirety of the project. Tonight we're really focusing in on phase one, so a portion of that, and seeking to gather input from the public on on the phase one portion of the work. So this board's work tonight is focused on phase one. The town board's work on March 12th, kicking that process off, will focus on the overall project just so that you have that understanding as, you, as you're um, um, offering your comments. And, and if I might just to supplement it again for the public, the planning board can't act until the town board finishes. So in other words, if the town board doesn't rezone the property, we never actually get to you concluding on the site plan until the town board finishes the environmental review. It never comes to the planning board for a final determination. So these things are happening simultaneously, but the town board is going to act first and set the policy, which eventually is going to be what the planning board will act right. upon when it, it's its turn. So this is going to be proceeding for a while, and this is the opening of that public hearing process. Okay. Remember my question. <laughs> um, my question, we've received a lot of material to review in addition to what is coming up tomorrow. Um, we are reviewing a site plan tonight in part. That will not include a discussion of the pathway that is being suggested going down, that will be on a subsequent site plan, but not tonight, correct? No. There, because it's a different... The, there is a, a walking path that is proposed as part of phase one. It follows the loop road and is to serve as a jogging trail for um, track programs. We are going to branch off of that, head to the north to come down into the hamlet. We are still working out the details of how that connection okay, is going to happen. I was confused because when I read it, it's just not going to be discussed tonight. But I was trying to figure out how it was going to be discussed. It can be discussed tonight. It's it's just no, we no, it's we're right. still we're still working out the details when we yeah, get down I, to one hundred. I want to know the details, so it's just not necessary. I had the same question as Nancy. Just want to confirm that reading Surrett's memo, so it's still part of this phase. Correct. Okay. But we, owe you, but we owe you a plan with details. Details yes, on it. Yes, yes, right. that was the part. <laughs> not, it's not on this plan. It'll come up. At Correct. Yeah. We have it shown on our overall site plan currently. Um, so you can see the general path that we're going to be coming down the hill. It's really the end connections that we're working out the details on. Yeah, impressionistically, it looked like it was going to be a tight fit at the end point, so to speak. So That's the spot we're working on right now. Okay. And we owe you details Good. on it. Good to hear. Good to hear. <laughs> Okay. Is there anyone that wishes to be heard on this subject? <clears throat> Some guy behind me. Yeah, he beat you to it. <laughs> Please identify yourself for the record. Frank Tomasulo. Uh, question. And we've spent a lot of time and, and great job and great use um, talking about uh, the environment um, and the way I see it this is the heart of this project this parcel uh, this phase mm -hmm. so to think that everything has to be confined to the boundaries of this project to me is not really looking at it realistically because this part of the project will drive the entire project. For example, I question, as you did, the trail. I also made a note that the boundaries of the entire property contribute to some existing problem in this town that has been forever. And I've lived in this town for 40 some odd years at this point. Which, which and that is litter, okay? And 
the boundaries of this project on Route 138, Route 100, and 116 are right now littered. A higher degree on some routes than others. This is property that is owned by the current owner and developer of this project. This is without 1,800 people at this site. So I'm concerned about the salamanders and the frogs, but I'm concerned about the people, us, we, mm -hmm. who live here, who are impacted by an issue right now and have been for quite a while. And we can't get our arms around it quite yet. And we're going to impact it by a terrific development that has some edges to it, both literally and figuratively. The edges being the roots and the impact that it'll have. How are we, the town, and the developer slash user, because it is one and the same. It is not a developer and a user. It is one and the same. How are we going to monitor and address this? What resources are going to be brought to the fore that have to increase significantly? Because if you look at the down fence that's been downed and the brick wall and the stone wall that's been down for all these months, many, many, many months, and have not been repaired, and you look at all of the litter along 138 that has not been picked up because of safety issues, I'm concerned that it's going to be amplified further. I also am confused when I read, and I maybe didn't read it thoroughly enough, but Rich and Mark, I thought initially there was a significant amount of excess fill on the, land, on the property. And now we're talking about importing a lot. Is that right, Rich? Yeah, I can address that. Okay. Yeah, it is. Because I, I, I'm sorry. So I'm, I'm, I, but that, I, I think that applies very specifically to this parcel. Is that right? Yeah, so, yeah. so, so okay. the general format is uh, you state your questions, sir. Yes, sir. And your concerns and comments. Okay. And then they are, uh, have an opportunity to rebut them. Terrific. Instead Thank of you. It being Thank like you. A so that's a question. Dialogue that, that's a two. question. Thank you. No worries. Um, so the two issues that I'm I, I, um, addressing uh, are the, uh, the litter issue and, and the keeping of the boundaries um, and, and, and evidenced by what we have right now. Um, and the amplification of that, and the importation versus exportation of, of soil on, on the property, which kind of threw me a little bit. One last thing, security. And I know we talked about it before. I don't know what the resolve is, um, but our police force is taxed right now, and I'm hoping that there is a resolve and an understanding of the contribution of the developer slash user uh, to remedy what has to be foreseen as a potential problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, uh, generally speaking, I would say as we are dealing with the site plan within the ring road, you, you, most of your concerns are really that of the, for the town board, which is the lead agency on the entire project. Um, Certainly with uh, security, we have discussed it here, and I'm sure the town board will, has also discussed it with the applicant. It is a concern of all of us, and we are well aware of it. Yeah, Thank you for that, your I think comments. there's a pretty strong cons security consultant that was brought on the team. Yes, yeah, yeah. Sure, I mean, just briefly on the first and the third, I'll let Rich answer the second. With regard to the litter, it's the first I frankly have heard of it, although from the description of it, I would think that it sounds like some of it is out in the state roadway, in the state area, et cetera, because that's far away from anything that's current. There's nothing operating, frankly, on our particular property. So I, I don't think it's coming from us. If people are trespassing and littering down there, I'll have people take a look. I, you know, I, I don't know that 
that that's an issue with regard to how you deal with litter on any of your commercial properties or anything. Of course, if people come into a commercial property, but there are laws and there are things that are there. But we'll look into if there's an existing issue having anything to do with our problem. You've met Caesar Court many times, who's the person who uh, is employed by the landlord, who's there every day and is looking at these properties and making sure that they're maintained and kept in great fashion. And I'll bring this to his attention and we'll go take a look and see if there's well, anything there. Uh, previously, we heard about beer cans and treadmills on the state property. So Correct. I mean, it's all- It's not unique. A, a, anywhere you have empty property that no, some people aren't paying attention, people are gonna dump, but we'll take a look and if there's something there, we'll certainly clean it up. Uh, on the issue of security, again, that will be, a portion of that will be addressed on March 12th. Uh, there's really two issues that are being raised. One, which is what is the plan? There are certain things that we will talk about publicly and certain things that we won't. We've put a top rate security person on the payroll who's now, who is the consultant to the uh, schools here locally and, and is used to working with this particular police department. They've already started putting together the manual and things, some of which will be public, uh, and we will have that discussion with regard to the question that had to do with taxing and the economic impact and the, the impacts we have already met with the uh, local uh, members of both your fire department, the local police department, the state troopers to have an understanding of that. It's part of the environmental review that's before the town board and I can assure you there are lots of taxes going, that are going to be paid by this for-profit school as part of this. The one thing I want to make sure that it's understood is there actually are two specific and different entities. There is a landlord that's gonna own this property, all of the property, and there's going to be a school that's going to be a tenant on two of the parcels having to do with where the school is located and where that utility parcel is. But they are two separate entities. There's a landlord and there's a tenant like other commercial facilities. So mm -hmm. I wanted to clear the record up. I'll ask Rich to answer the question on uh, the fill issue. So relative to cuts and fills, um, we have been homing in on a number. So on our phase one site plans, we have a more specific cut fill analysis that was done as part of Seeker. Um, right now we have 6,000 yards of excess fill, um, meaning we would have an export. Um, and right now in phase two, we're showing, and this is part of the Seeker set again that the town board is looking at, 4,000 yards of excess fill coming off the site. And then phase three, we're down to 2,000 yards. We are moving tens of thousands of yards in each phase. Phase one, we're moving over 50,000 around on site. So when I have 6,000 yards of excess fill, I'm getting very close to balance. As we continue down the site plan process, it's to our advantage to try and bring that to balance because when you have to import or export, it costs extra money. Mm -hmm. So we are tweaking the grading plans as we go through this site plan process, and we're gonna try and bring it closer to balance, if not balanced. It's just a matter of raising and lowering the field elevation slightly to balance out your cut and fills. But right now we're pretty close to that number. Uh, just, just, go ahead. Yeah, new person, yeah. Good evening, uh, Bart Lansky, 28 Ridgeway. I'm about five houses away from the IBM property. Um, I wanted to look at the plans. Are they available anywhere publicly? Yes, Okay. they are. Uh, on the website, uh, are they not? On the website? There, there should, there's, this, there's a full circulation. Um, I believe there's a full set upstairs in the, in the planning and engineering department. Okay. By way of disclosure, I serve on the uh, Board of Assessment Review here and the Zoning Board. Oh. Um, my other questions are, there's an, a fire road which exists now which goes out to Lake Purdy's entranceway. Um, is that road going to be reestablished or is that road not going to be reestablished. And if it does get reestablished, can it be bi-directional in case 116 gets shut down and the residents need to get out onto 100 or some other direction? I think that's probably a, a, a question for the town board. Or does that fall under a traffic study? I'm going to make a note of it. And you know, I'm, I'm obviously supporting both boards, so I'm making a note of that. Um, Rich can probably maybe answer the specific question. Uh, right now, there's no plan. Establishing connections to the Lake Cruz. I think you're talking about 
Yeah, yeah, there's, there's a fire. There's a you can see the you can see the uh, the old speakers. It's not part of it is not part of the board. So I'm just curious. Would you be? Would are are you advocating? Would you think that that's a benefit that the town should consider? Um, or you? I I think if it if they do, obviously it was there for a reason. IBM had it because in case of emergency they wanted to get people out of the site, and so frankly, if there is an emergency. Um, and they need to get people out of the site for some reason. People are going to come through Purdy's. Um, there is a there is a communication. People go through that every day um, between the sites. So uh, my thought was, if it's reestablished, it should be bidirectional. Okay. In case in case there is an emergency in Lake Purdy's, we should be able to get out that way. And if they have there's an emergency there, they should be able to get the, get out this way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. I would. Um, and my last question was, is there any I've, it's wonderful, the project, and it's wonderful to hear that it's for, for profit and that it's going to stay on the tax rolls. But is there any uh, condition in the special use permit that it stays that way? Um, stays what way? As a for profit institution. No, I don't, I don't think you can do that. I know there are some. Well, it would require on another whole land. process. Yeah. I, would, I mean, right now, the project as approved is going to be a for profit school. Sure. The special permit. Will be issued in that in that vein. If it was going to be changed, it would have to be a, pub, a, a new public process. That would be my understanding. Mark. Only if it's conditioned that way. So certainly, a corporation can change its status from profit to non-for-profit. So if you have a condition in the special use permit, that's that's one approach. If there's no condition, then then certainly they can change. So, and I think, and I want to say, I think it's a wonderful project for Somers. And, you know, I support it and I hope all, everybody else does. But, I, but it would be a big hit uh, to the tax roll if we lost all uh, those ratables. Good point. I'm, okay. I'll make yes, and, and just remember, we are not the lead agency the town board is. We're here strictly for but planning, <laughs> subdivision, but and you bring up some very good points with, that we can't address. We, we actually with, wait, gotta, with all due respect, ma'am, if you are the one issuing the special use permit, you, you certainly have a right con to condition yeah, that special the, use permit. I don't know that no, no. that's a condition that we did. the town board could put on it. Yeah, the so town board would be issuing that permit anyway. This board would be we're issuing a site plan approval. We're not doing it. We're, we're not, not doing it. I, I regardless, I've, I've, got your, I've got the note, and I will, I, I'm supporting both boards, and I'll make sure that you know, uh, council um, is aware of that. Thank you very and much. I meant it as a compliment to you. <laughs> okay. That no. that we're limited in what we can do. We're the planning board. We do planning things. No, we we, uh, we and, voice and, concerns and, about uh, with with some of the OB100 language and how that could potentially impact this project down the road should things change. And uh, and and I believe that was clarified by the clients' council. Um, but it was voiced and addressed at the town board and brought to their attention. So, so very similarly, this this could be something that we do the same. Yep. Uh, so not just about the initial zoning, but now also about its overall status. Well, and this board is an involved agency, so I mean that's yeah. totally appropriate to be providing those comments. Sure. And the process here is different than normal, right? Right. Normally, this would be in front of the ZBA. Um, no. 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 Not for site no. plan. Yeah, not the site plan, but the zoning case. changes. Well, yeah. no, the zoning no, no. change would always be no. town board. That's always town, town board. board. Yeah. Town board. If it needed variances, it would be in front of the ZBA for that purpose. But the application itself would go to the town board. Town board and, cha yeah. changes zoning. Yeah. No one else, and there's no one else in town has the authority to change zoning. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else? You were first. Go ahead. We know him. <laughs> Hi, my name is Pat Senna from Lincolndale. Um, one of the questions I have for the uh, developers is the north and south parcels uh, that were discussed here. They will have, as I understand it, uh, their own zoning. They'll be subdivided parcels available for development. Is that true? Yeah, is that still, true? 
they're all they, they'll be subdivided parcels. Correct. Yeah. So in the future, they could be. They'll be OB 100. OB correct. 100. So another applicant could come in and say, "I want to build a corporation on that parcel." He could apply. True. The, he could true. apply. The, okay. Uh, so the environmental impact statement at both levels, the, plan, uh, the planning board and the town board, have to consider the possible future impacts of a corporation on the north and the south. Now, when we approved the original IBM property, we approved a certain impact on 745 acres, mm -hmm. right? So this little piece, which I, we support, I support it, I think it's a great, um, tax uh, relief for the town. I think it's going to be great for the community. But I'm concerned about future development on the separate parcels of north and south. What will happen there? What are the plans for it? What limitations will there be? Well, they've already limited some of it. Yeah, no, I understand we, that. We, we voiced those very same concerns. Yes. Good. And Good. the way it was explained to me and <clears throat> the board, and correct me if I'm wrong, a new, any applicant can come in yes. and say, hey, I want to build a 55-story skyscraper on this parcel. Yes. It has to be approved. And yes. that approval process still is falls within here or the yes. town board or the zoning board if it's applicable. So while, yes, at, at, in, in the OB100 and the language that's being changed in order to facilitate this project, there is always that risk. But, you, but, the, but the risk is mitigated by the fact that it, there are other town regulations that require... Right, 600 a, foot... Uh, there's, there's so many layers involved right. in this, and Councilor, yeah. again, correct me if I'm wrong, that I'm, I, as a resident, feel confident now, after it was explained to me, that that is not going to happen. And if it does happen, again, it's anyone's free to come in here and say, hey, I want to build this. I want to build it, this it, giant it had, facility here. I think if it, did, if it did, it would open the book again. Right. Yeah. And we would open the whole book. No, I understand that. And, but and, and it would probably involve, may go to a master plan. Yeah. Here's my concern. Type of, type of review. Yeah. Here's my concern. When we approved the original IBM project, yeah. We approved a certain impact for 745 acres. Right. Now, it seems to me to be fair to the people. I'm particularly concerned about the Dean's Bridge Road and the uh, uh, Lake Purdy's people. One of the big issues we had back in 1983, I think we found today, we passed this, um, <clears throat> was traffic impact to those communities. Yes. Yeah. I now, I'm concerned that if the STEAM school plus two additional parcels are developed, the overall traffic impact might be more than what we originally told the people of the town uh, that the IBM project would have. So I'm concerned about the overall impact of the ultimate development mm -hmm. of parcels north and south. Um, but I, I agree with the uh, planning board member um, that uh, probably existing regulations like 600 foot setbacks and so forth and drainage and will prevent a, a large uh, corporation from winding up there. Yeah, the advantage here is we're, we're reducing some of that impervious Yeah, surface. no, I know that. And if they wanted to increase it, <clears throat> Uh, we yeah, no, I know they'd have to come back here, and I know you would protect the townspeople, and I, the town board would too. But I just wanted to bring the issue of future development on parcels north and south as something that could affect uh, the future of uh, the people who live nearby. My understanding is there is none contemplated at this time. Well, no, I know that, but... Right, but I, you never I, know. I will just add that you know the proposal does include um, some restrictions on that on that um, those north and south parcels. So, if you think you're talking about it from an environmental review perspective, right, when the overall um, um, project was contemplated, there was and the zoning was established, there was a certain level of review around assigning that zoning to the, the to those areas, right. So. 
there's an inherent review of that to be done, and then again, all the controls in place that that we just mm -hmm. that we just talked about on t on top of that. Well, let me you ask. Know, but I did want to point out that the the town board working with the applicant has foreseen um, you know one potential concern and has restricted that zoning so that it would not um, um, accommodate. Um, um, like condos in that area. No, I understand All right. that. So, I've read that. so the, the, yeah. they've already backed off that, that zoning a little bit in order to, to minimize the impact that could happen from that zone if left preserved right. in its current but form. But the zoning will continue to be OB100? Yes. 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 On those yes. parcels? Yes. yes. Why couldn't it be uh, I think, some it's, new, I think it's fair for you to bring zone. I think that that's a fair comment and something that the town board should contemplate as part okay. of their deliberations. Well, I know the big meeting is on the 12th of March, and uh, I think the people from uh, Lake Purdy's and Dean's Bridge and 138 should attend that meeting. Right. And towards your last point, I just want to let you know there is a very detailed traffic study being done. Um, yeah. All that work is being done as part of the overall project. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Pat. And I think also to Dennis's point about any if there were to be any future development on either the north or south parcels, it would reopen the book, also meaning we'd be looking at the cumulative impacts. Yeah, right. So the, the circumstances oh. and development in that area of the town has changed already and increased. So that would be even more impact that we'd be looking at. So I understand that you're looking at the original amount of land on which IBM was done, and now we're talking about smaller parcels. Maybe they seem more vulnerable. Mm -hmm but they're still going to be protected by the review. Yeah, the overall issue, I'm sorry uh, for my voice. I've got uh -huh. a lot of phonia, which is kind of hard to deal with. But anyway, um, the overall issue was when we made the original approval on that property, 745 acres, we said there's going to be this impact. And the people of the town accepted it. At the end of the day, the 745 acre impact should be, no, in my view, should be no more than was promised back in 1983. That's what I'm saying. Understood. Yeah. And I think with. And that's your cumulative impact. Uh, Just for the, right. for the newer residents in the town who may not know you, Mr. DeSena, can, can you. Just explain, you kept saying we, oh. we approved. For those at home and in the room who don't know your history, okay. can you my just name is Patrick DeSena. Uh, I was a councilman in this town for 16 years, happily, um, and our board in 1983 or 84 approved the original IBM uh, development. Also, we did Pepsi, too. Um, but uh, I felt an obligation to speak to the people we promised, and it's townspeople, you know, whether they're new people or old people or whatever. Uh, we said there's going to be this impact on 745 acres, and I want to make sure that the impact from the ultimate development of that 745 acres is no more than we promised. So that's where I'm coming from. But anyway, but thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And we appreciate your concerns. Um, I would just like to add to Pat's concerns that I remember from being involved in those days that you were not guaranteeing how much IBM was going to impact the town you because it was always possible because of how much land was rezoned OB100 there could always be more factories built there always that has never gone away same goes for Pepsi Think about it. It hasn't changed. It's I, I, always been there. And if I might, to the councilman's point, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I appreciate the comments. We have stated, and it's been locked in, that we are not, we have no plan for that. There's nothing <laughs> here. We're going to have to wait to see how the school works out, and, and it goes down the road. But I will mention, you mentioned the traffic impacts, which are the great concern. And just to, to understand in context of IBM, we have 2,000 less parking spaces. Yes. We have considered, you can't even compare the traffic of what we're talking about to what was there 
they came in at peak hour, they left at peak hour. These are cars that are, it's nothing close. It, and, and frankly, if we put another IBM on the other side, on, the, on what's left of the property of what we could fit, you'd still be under what you approved yeah. back Absolutely. in the 1980s. So I just, Absolutely. I wanted to put that out. There is a traffic Absolutely. report, but I wanted to point out that that's, nobody is looking to do that. Remember, the owner of this also owns the Pepsi site and is as invested in Somers as anybody who's been here for 40 years. They've made an enormous investment here because they believe in the town and they want to be good corporate citizens and they have been and that's what we're looking to create and we, you know the school is the first part of what so we're I'm trying to do the steam school will not generate a lot of traffic I'm right. worried about parcels north and south well we hope to be back here someday on that i don't know if i'll still be around but hopefully <laughs> comments and, and, and and we're, public comment i think we have two more <laughs> Good evening, Tim Allen at Bibbo Associates. Um, I think you all know me. Um, <laughs> we represent the Gigliottis who uh, actually own properties down on Route 100. Um, and uh, through the past years, and, and our, our office actually reviewed this back in the 80s as, as part of the town re review and everything else. We reviewed Pepsi also for the town. Um, we go back a long ways in this in this community. Um, Leonard was on the town board. I think maybe Dennis was with him at the time. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, we know this property intimately and through my process of where I've, my offices and what have you, um, we've had a lot of well problems down below this property. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to just make clear, and maybe March 12th is a better time to bring this up, but um, certainly, um, Water quality and quantity is going to be an issue here. Um, and I've spoken to Rich, I've spoken to Joe, I've spoken to Supervisor Morrissey about this. Um, it's, we've been contaminated with salts. Um, we have treatment systems on Mill Pond offices where my offices are. We've got uh, treatment systems on the Burger Barn, which we all know, and also at the uh, mobile station. So, and also this townhouse. Townhouse. Yeah, this exactly, building. exactly. So, it's been an issue over the years. It's been attributed to um, IBM uh, with the salt use up there. Um, maybe rightfully so, maybe not, but um, nonetheless, uh, just want to make sure that this board and the town board make sure that water quality and quantity is taken care of. And, and I think we've all between the engineers, we've discussed this already. Um, again, I, I represent Gigliottis who would love to get a, get rid of their system. It's high maintenance. It's, uh, you know, it, when you mm -hmm. get into the, these treatment systems for salt, um, it's amazing uh, how much money it costs you to, to basically treat the salts that are coming through our wells. Um, I just want to say that, and uh, that's... I'll leave it at that. Yeah, uh, I, by the way, I've never, never come in objection to a project, and I never will. I love this project. It's a great yeah, project. Yeah. But uh, nonetheless, uh, the impacts have to be looked at. Uh, and on behalf of our client and a lot of the clients around here and, and people around town, um, they've all been impacted by what may or may not be an issue. What was an issue uh, was the use of salts in that parcel. And, and I guess, for one, I don't understand why we're still using salt anywhere in this town that we're well driven. You know, we are a community of wells. And, and yes. I can go to BJ's or anywhere and buy a bucket, of fi a five-gallon bucket of... Uh, of a product that is much more environmentally friendly and it's not salt. I don't know why the town is still using salt or the certainly the uh, owner of the, 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 the state. IBM yeah. or and the state in it. Why right. are we still using salt? I don't know. Well, if you recall back in the 1980s, I believe uh, IBM put up a salt shed um, because they had un, unmitigated salt that was just, they just pile it up and they would use it up there. Um, I think back in the 80s or 90s, they put up a salt shed, which I'm assuming is going to stay, right? Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, Rich is going to. Rich is going to. I know he's going to make me look foolish, but uh, <laughs> talking about uh, Route 100 salting and everything else. But uh, it was attributed back in the day to a lot of the salt that IBM was using unmitigated, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's that's undisputed. But Rich, Rich is going to tell me that I'm wrong. But can yeah, we, can we as a town get away from salt? That's my question. I guess. Yeah, I, that's, that's a good point. You're you're on part of it. Um, you know, we are not IBM. Some of the good news with our application is the 2,000 parking spaces that we're eliminating is eliminating a lot of that salt load. Um, we have a concern for salt not just because we now control the IBM property, but we also hold a large amount of land on the other side of Route 100 as well that surrounds your client's properties. Um, we, as hearing some of the concerns at the previous planning board meetings, have engaged WSP, our hydrogeologist, Tom Cusack, who is very knowledgeable in chlorides, to develop a salt, a salt management plan for our facility. Um, he's going to be working on that, and we'll be providing that to the town. Um, we are keeping the salt shed. We're not proposing any modifications at the facilities yards, although they have moved to a brine solution as opposed to the salts. And you know, Tom's going to address all that when he submits his salt management plan and how to reduce salt application. But the real benefit is the reduction in parking, right? And that's how we're going to reduce our loading. But to your point, it's, it isn't just us. Um, oh, I, we tend to see a lot of chlorides and wells along state highways. New York State DOT tends to apply a lot of salts on their roads. Um, we believe all the adjacent landowners who are impacted by this should have their own salt management plans and help be part of the solution. But we think on the whole our application will be a lot different than IBM because we're not IBM. We're creating a lot of ball fields and yeah. in, in little parking. No, right, but Rich, to be clear, you're, you, Tom is not. He, I know we know, and we've spoken at length of him looking at quantity mm -hmm. and demonstrating quantity. I just want to make sure that we're, you know, that everybody's aware that we are looking at quality as well. You, there is going to be quality testing done on the well, so we understand what the water quality is. You need that for your own treatment purposes for your use on site, and that's going to be an important. Oh, absolutely, element. and we we have our own chloride treatment facilities on site that we have to upkeep, and the more we can help the chloride problem, it helps us as well. And yeah, we're, we're focused on quantity and quality because we're a public water supply. Anyone else? Oh. Tim's got to follow up. Redirect. <laughs> Redirect. Redirect, Your Honor. Um, that's kind of my point is that, you know, we're, we're they've, they've already got a treatment plan on their site, so there, there is a salt issue. And uh, I, I just don't know how we mitigate that to lessen it on the burden of the rest of the town. Um, and maybe Mr. Williams can address that through future. W town. What, what? Town? I, I, I mean, it's Just been it's an ongoing from the 1970s and probably through the 80s and what have you. Yeah. But um, uh, I mean, I looked at some of the stuff that was the airport, and I remember you know Leonard Bibbo telling me about the air, you know flying yeah. into there, and uh, yeah. it was some uh, it was very interesting history of this property. It's it's yes, it it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, and we talked about this when we did uh, the property up the street about the, the heliport and the old 19th hole and things like that. That, that, that it was it's it's amazing. Having said that, um, I'm going to wrap up now, and uh, I, I just think it needs to be addressed at some point. Um, whether they can fix it or not, I don't know the answer, but I'm just saying it's out there. I think I think it goes beyond this property. I think it it, it, it's, it's it could this, be this property. It's the town, the state. What about individual homeowners? Individual homeowners. I think maybe there's a grant that's 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 lessening the burden of the treatment that all these local businesses have to do, including this townhouse. I mean, in terms yeah. of what what has to happen. But um, very frankly, it is a problem. I can tell you that. I don't use rock salt on my driveway. No, I use I this other product. Yes, but that doesn't solve the problem from 10, 15 years ago. No, no, no. I'm saying yeah, exactly. It's no, done. I understand. Let, you're, let's, you're, fix you're, it. let's fix it going forward. Exactly. Right. You're, you're doing the right thing. Can we uh, can we send a memo from this board to the Energy Environment Committee? They're generally in sync with uh, public relations campaigns and educational campaigns, and this may be something worth for them to explore uh, as a potential 2020 uh, campaign to try to get some of the town residents aware that uh, you know salt is an issue, that there are parts of Somers that have salt contamination, and a lot of it is because of the harsh winters that we've experienced here and the use of salt. And may, that might be something that they may want to uh, take up 
and sort of get that out there to try to get folks to shy away from what we always thought was safe because we put it on our food. Um, but when it's in large quantities like that, uh, mm -hmm. it's not because it seeps into the groundwater and, and obviously contaminates like, like it has been. So I, I think that might be a, a good way to us address some of the concerns with that. Previous uh, meetings, we have discussed the wells and the well contamination with salt and other stuff. So the board just wanted to put it out that the board is aware of it. Um, we have addressed it. There are some conditions that require testing and, and continued monitoring and whatnot. So um, it is concerning, but uh, it's being addressed. I, w I would support that. Send the memo with a copy to the town board. Absolutely. Yes, yes. CC uh, the town board so that they're aware that one of the town oh. committees uh, m may be looking at this. So. Yeah. No, I support that. Do we have two others? Any, uh, anyone else? Uh, my name is Eric Marcos. We live at 19 Route 116, off the map above the Amoeba. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're right across from one of the entry driveways to the property. And so I have a three-part question. The traffic, is there a traffic hierarchy to the, uh, to the driveways for this property? Um, is there, are there primary entrance and exits? And are some meant for just utility and all that stuff? So traffic. Second one is about light. Are the ball fields going to be lit at night is my question. And the third question is water related. When we moved to our house in 2000 at this location, we were told by our well driller that the reason we had to drill a 604 foot well is because there are lots of straws in the drink across the road at IBM. Don't know if it's true or if it's lore, but we have a 600 plus foot well in order to have water. And Unusual. it was expensive. And, and, you know, we're concerned about not just the quality of water that was raised, but availability mm -hmm. in the aquifer. Three parts. Thank you. And we're really excited about the project. As far as traffic hierarchy, um, Route 100 is our primary entrance. Um, we're not restricting any of the other accesses, um, but Route 100 will be our primary. 138 is now closed. Uh, all, all the entrances are semi-closed depending on if any damage has been done to the gates recently. People are curious about the property. Um, the second question was lighting. Yes, um, there are fields that are proposed to be lit. There's two. The first one is in phase one. It is the ball field towards the top of the page. Um, contained in our seeker analysis is all sorts of photometric diagrams, glare diagrams, um, we are using cutting edge technology. I live in town. When I think of lighting, I think of Somers High School and the view that you get from, for instance, driving 202. Those are not the lights we're using. Um, if you wanna see the type of lights, you can go down to Horace Greeley High School. Um, uh, they were designed by Joe's office. Um, they are direct down lighting LEDs, full cut off. Um, they're much different than the technologies we're used to seeing. Yeah, anybody concerned with lighting, I would just say, go check that out one night. I mean, you know, it, it's quite amazing what the new technology and the LED technology can do. It's very directional and very focused. There's, I think there's literally one home that is 50 feet off of the end zone, and that property is dark when those lights are on. And yeah. all that work is available publicly. All the studies. It, it's all yeah. in our experience. And the studies yeah, yeah. are part of the document if you want to actually look at the photometrics for it. We've done cross sections through multiple parts of town, so there's a lot of information in there. Um, the third question, I'm sorry. Water quantity. Water quantity. Um, we are going to be testing our existing wells. Um, we will be seeking to expand our water supply in phases two and phases three, but we're going to be focusing on the southern parts of the sites primarily. We have identified preliminary well sites in the expanded EAF. And we are going to, when we do start developing those water sources, um, since they are new public water supplies, we'll have to make sure that we are not impacting off-site wells as part of the health department. Again, the health department will have jurisdiction over that and, and we'll observe what we're doing as far as testing and approval of those water supplies. They're, they're doing, you know, ultimately there will be detailed pumping tests and monitoring done well, when the, they get to the development of those wells. I read the hydrology report just before I came in. It's really very interesting about your existing bedrock uh, wells. And, uh, and the future looks good up there. By the way, the three failed wells, the three original failed wells, I finally found out 
uh, from my another councilman from Pat DeSennis days. Those three wells that failed back in uh, <clears throat> the early 1980s were lo located in sand and gravel aquifer owned by good old Lyman Kip. And uh, in, if, in addition to the 740 mountain acreage, IBM had the foresight to buy all of Lyman Kip's 350, 400 acres, and uh, it's understandable why they were no good. <coughs> it has a, it doesn't have a good history. I mean, although it built 684 and the Bronx Expressway and uh, 287 <laughs> and, and uh, other things happened uh, which fouled that water. And it included the original um, uh, storage of fuel for the airport because that's what they found in the wells. The original <clears throat> Stewart Airport. Yes, the original Stewart Airport. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because they owned that land as well. <laughs> they rented for the famous um, um, dump site. Remember the fellow who owned the, the original dump site? Uh, the Wiggins. Yeah, the Wiggins. He rented that land. He rented that land at sixty dollars a month, uh, sixty dollars a year from uh, the guy that owned the seven hundred forty acres from the from the Brady family. You didn't need that history. You didn't need that history. <laughs> there are lots of reasons why that aquifer has water problems. Anyone else? Not just salt. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Matt Parazan. I live on 138. Uh, my question to you guys is you did a traffic study, uh, but what about the pedestrians? Obviously, you're going to have kids coming out of the school, and same, the gentleman raised the question with the litter. Is there a plan to connect the entrances with sidewalks or even on Route 100, if you're saying that Route 100 is going to be your main entrance? And you talked about trails, and how many trails are going to be built? Is it only going to be one? Is it going to be multiple on the property? So that's my question. Thank you. So part of the security plan that's being developed is going to address how and where um, we're going to allow students to go. Right now, other than the connection down to the hamlet, we're not <coughs> proposing any other pedestrian connections to the state highway system, either 116 or 138. We do envision a shuttle service being provided in order to transport students to the train stations, um, similar to what Kennedy High School does, um, as well as also into the Hamlet. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, any continue. other discussion here? Uh, I think we have to, con you know, I think we just continue, continue. public well, hearing. The problem is, in my opinion, our next meeting is March 11th. The town board meeting is March 12th. Yeah, I, I would suggest we adjourn until April. Yeah. If we can continue it to April, mm -hmm. it would make more sense. You okay with that, Mark? Yeah, do you know what date the meeting is? April 15th. Oh, tax day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's exciting. No. I think that makes sense. Yeah, no. We have no objection. We are going to be working with, with staff between now and then on, on, on perfecting the plans that uh, need to be shown to you. So, uh, and I think we will hopefully be also getting direction from the town with regard to where they, where they are with the zone change, et cetera, in March. So yeah. we have no issue with that. Okay. I think that that way, by the time you come back, it's a more fully developed plan. It increases the likelihood, I think, that you open and close a public hearing there because right. you'll actually have the plan you're talking right. about. Right. So. Yeah, I think by that time we should have enough to make, you know, an informed decision. Yeah. I think, and I think a lot of it, obviously, we have to follow the town board. So the town board ultimately has to Absolutely. conclude its process before we can even close the public hearing and move and make any yeah, action. Yeah, we, we can until they do. Correct. Um, I do have a question <laughs> um, and a concern, and that is when I see. Pat to Senate, it's, it's made me think of it. When Pat was on the board, one of the shockers was about IBM, as, as happy as everybody was ultimately with IBM, what they weren't prepared for was what IBM looked like. 
we did not in those days have the legal right to review architecture. And so that was quite a shock. And as a result of that, that town board created the Architectural Review Board. And I was wondering, we have this field house, which I've seen sketches of, and at some point it seems to me it would be appropriate for them to review um, the architecture involved here. Um, certainly in light of the fact they now exist because of uh, the design. <laughs> You laugh, but we're consulting with Pay Partnership on the field house you because of the way it's going to relate into the other yes, buildings. It, so, it, we've already been told so yes, what it has I, to look like. We know. will go through the appropriate procedure with the town right. with respect to it. It is a new structure, and it will have to go through the appropriate requirements. Right, right. Yeah. But I didn't see it anywhere, so I was concerned that it not be missed out. Right. Okay. okay. I know one way to get the answer to that question. Bonnie, did we, did, was it submitted digitally that, that it could have been uploaded? My guess is it's on the town board website. It should be. It should yeah. be by, our, by our code it's supposed to be. Yeah. So if it's not there now, it will surely be there before March 12th. Yep. Okay, continue it until April 15th. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Final item this evening, Cobbling Rock. <clears throat> discussion of a conservation subdivision plan. Wetland report. <clears throat> and tree plan, if any. <clears throat> oh. Yeah, I agree. We <laughs> saved them. I got, I got the little baby ones, and I got the big ones that you can find at Warren Beesman. Well, now thumb drives are part of my collection. These are good. Okay. I didn't recognize Pat until he said his name. I, I, I saw a friendly face, but I didn't know. No. I recognize the voice. Yes. yes. I get the same. Thing. Yes. <coughs> Last one. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. You blame me for being ambitious. Delaying this thing. Go ahead. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Matt Geronda from Bibo Associates. Here on behalf of the applicant, uh, Mr. Vito Andriano, regarding the Cobbling Rock Estates Conservation Subdivision. Um, as the board is aware, uh, we were previously at a meeting in um, November where we introduced the uh, conservation subdivision layout um, mm -hmm. after we had proceeded with a review on a conventional subdivision to determine our zoning compliant lot count. Uh, we've since completed the plan, um, taken it to a, a, a next step as far as uh, fully developed site plans and grading and stormwater designs. We've gotten some comments from the from the engineer um, generally uh, most of them very easily addressable have some invert elevations and, and whatnot we'll have to adjust um, we're here tonight to discuss further and, and schedule public hearing so we can move forward with applications to outside agencies um, I don't know if the board has any further comments regarding the conservation subdivision or the layout that we proposed but be happy to answer Mm -hmm. I mean, Dennis, I'll just go real quick. I, I can tell you that yeah. we basically um, have now done complete review. Remember, up to this point, we were dealing with conventional. Most of our mm -hmm. comments and memorandum were focused on the conventional. We've now reset those comments towards the conservation subdivision, and, and I think that you know, it, I it, it, I like the way this looks. I think I think yeah. it's a very nicely laid out yes. subdivision. Um, there are. You know, there's some things we need to do, as as Matt mentioned. That we got we we've got to you know do the field testing in certain areas. We've got a you know a couple of minor things around the stormwater. But but I'm uh, I'm would be have no objection if the board chose to set the public hearing. 
We wouldn't be able to close that public hearing until all the stormwater elements, specifically the, the, the field testing, was complete. Um, that's a requirement that we've negotiated with the Watershed Inspector General, so I will hold firm on that. Um, and uh, But other than that, I have no, uh, no objection if the board chose to move forward and wanted to open the hearing. Yeah, I, <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I agree. I, I like the, uh, the layout. It, uh, it's not cookie cutter. It's clustered. We've saved a lot of open space. It's, uh, I think, the best use of the property. Uh, board? Just the one question. In Surrett's <clears throat> memo, when yes. he's talking about the tree removal permit, um, There's a question t we have to address is, limits. do we want a tree removal plan? Do we want them to go around and tag trees that be removed? My opinion has always been specimen trees, yes. Junk trees, no. I, think I don't I want every tree in the pl place tagged. You know, specimen trees, I have no problem tagging them. Tagging them to preserve them. Tagging them to, well, I think, or, or I, I think, I think it, you know, it's yeah. about. Remember, the, the the fullest extent would say go map every single tree on this entire property, no, no. matter what it is, and then show us one, which ones you're taking down. Right? I mean, I think it gets a little crazy. We we this board yeah. has not necessarily applied that standard. We usually focus in on the area of disturbance, right? Right. Yes. And seek to identify trees that are worth saving within that area, uh, that limit of disturbance. So wh what I think the action would be is inside the limit of disturbance, are there any trees in the board would define that standard that you would want to see because maybe we want to tweak the driveway here or there, move the house here or there in order to accommodate those, those, those trees. That, that would but again, be the standard that we've applied previously. Identify specimen trees, not every junk tree in the place. That would be up to the board's discretion as to That's which- That's my opinion. And Surrett's memo takes it to a further length. It's taught within the limits of disturbance. It says it also has to be determined whether limits of a tree survey would be only those areas associated with common improvements, what we're th talking about, such as roads and drainage, or also areas related to home construction. Well, I know, like, for example, if you think about what we did in Granite Point, for example, mm -hmm. we focused in on the public, on, on, the, on, the, on the shared infrastructure, and even we did the same thing on, um, why can't I remember, the subdivision over in um, Lincolndale. I forgot the name of the... In Lincolndale? Uh, the one we just did, but uh, anyway. Mancini? Well, that's... Uh, no, but... but well, it, because it, though each of those would come up with site plans. What we did is that we we, we, we focused in on the public on the, on the on the common infrastructure now, and but we made a condition that when they come in for the actual permit to build the lot, they have to come in with a landscaping plan that reflects those trees and work with the the office upstairs to to do our best job to preserve trees worth preserving. Well, I mean, one thing that I would mention is obviously I think to Joe's point is. You know, we, there's common improvements. There's roads and drainage that that we're responsible for. The the individual future homeowners of these lots would be subject to permits at the time when they come in for building permits. Tree removal permits are one of those permits. Mm -hmm. um, we understand that that we would certainly have to identify trees to be removed to quantify tree removal permit fees and whatnot. That's why we've asked it to be made a condition of preliminary subdivision approval at this point. Um, we know we have to come back for final. We obviously have to proceed with several outside agencies, um, and we we expect to be back at final with with this subdivision plan. We don't we don't expect anything major to change, but um, I, I think limiting the um, the limits of the tree survey that we would have to complete that's associated with this tree removal permit to common improvements, meaning roads and drainage. I think. Uh, makes sense for this you know ultimately that's up to the board's discretion but one thing I would point to that the future homeowners of these lots will be subject to permits at the time that they develop them explain that to me the future homeowners developing uh, so I, I think well, the, I, you know we're going uh, through it right you're, now you're building yeah, yeah right? we're going through it right now so right now we're, <coughs> we're developing this piece of property here okay right. which was uh, part of the original subdivision, Mrs. Whitman's property, and 
when I go for my building permit, I mm -hmm. go speak to Steve upstairs. Him and I walk the property, and we look and see what how many trees we're taking down, okay, and how maybe to reposition the trees if that the house, if there are some specimen trees that we want to save. And that's exactly what we're doing now. We're actually turning the house 45 degrees to save all the large oaks that are along the rim, okay? So we go through this process, and I pay for every tree that we're right. taking down. Yeah. So basically what we're asking for is we, we can, you know, we can label these trees along the road, but as we go in for every permit, we work with Steve in the engineering department, and we discuss how we can reposition the house if we have a specimen tree, you know, or, you know, what ha you know, trees in this area, trees in these areas have to come down. So we'll just go, we go through it one lot at a time. Right. Right. And, we, and we can put that, stipulate that requirement, yeah. we do that all the time. I want to okay. comment on this. The day, the day we had the site walk, and I drove in, I used to have a friend that lived there years ago, former councilman. Uh, so I'm familiar with the neighborhood. But when I went for that site walk, I, was over, I went the long way on purpose. But I was overwhelmed with the properties that I passed and the specimen trees that I passed that were sited just right. Yeah. Well, that's, well, how the, that's how Cobbling Rock was, that's right. how it was and built. We're going to be able to save more trees than ever before because we're already at R120 and all these lots are, you know, two and a half, 2.8, 3.4, 14 acres. So we're going to say there isn't any ever, ever seen before. There isn't any place in this town, any neighbor. I've lived here for 56 years, mm -hmm. that is like this. Uh, I don't mean it's the prettiest, but I meant with so many specimen trees, just in the right place. Yeah, it's an old growth forest. Oh mm -hmm. yes. And the site walk proved it. Yeah. It was uh, the, the it's quite the, unique. The, the only comment I'll make towards this, working out some of this in the future, I, 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 I'm totally okay with that. I think we do, we do that all the time. Right now, you're, we have a comment that talks about let's try to have the storm water contained on the, the treatment on each lot and not have it run from one lot to the other <laughs> and have the, the downhill stormwater <laughs> system be treating stormwater coming from the uphill lot. I think to provide the maximum flexibility to protect trees in the future, I think that we should pay, take a hard look at that comment, right? To make sure that we can treat as much as possible on each individual That's lot and not rely on a downstream system just so that if you, as you're moving these things around in the future, um, I, I think it'll give us more flexibility that way. That's understood. It, that was one of the comments and we're, we're certainly gonna take a look at that. Um, you know, goes back to sort of our point about the individual lots being looked at as, as each one is built and being subject to their, their permitting. And, right. and that's always better when everything is contained on that lot, right. is my point. Um, you know, the, some of those areas that are run on from other lots are obviously, you know, all the impervious areas associated with the subdivision, we, we understand yes. we have to capture and we have to provide treatment for. Um, some of those areas that will run on to downhill lots are either undisturbed wooded or lawn areas, but we will certainly take a hard look at that and see what we can divert away from right. downhill properties. And, we, and the, other thing, the other thing that's connected to this, right, is we have a, a, you're relying on a lot of certain areas for critical stormwater on site. If we're gonna start moving stuff around in the future, um, that might trigger all new testing. And so right. you might wanna take a look Let's, at, are there specimen trees in right. those areas now that may be- This is sort of the conversation you and I have had in the past about the testing. And, and right. you know, obviously we have to proceed with the health department and, yeah. and DEP stormwater where we will, we've already dug about 40 test holes on this property. We'll probably dig another 60 when we, when we go through the process with the health department and, and DEP to finalize all our stormwater testing yeah. locations. And, and Joe has made it clear um, that we will have to proceed with some more infiltration testing prior to closing of the public hearing, which we will take care of. That's a priority on our list because um, we obviously do want to move forward with the outside agencies. Yeah. But uh, we certainly it's under consideration and, and we will do what we can to preserve any specimen trees. I know that the applicant wants to do the same. I think it only brings value yeah, to the property absolutely. in those lots. So it's, uh, it's definitely on our radar and it's, it's in our intention. Vito, are you planning on, you're going to develop this? Yes. Okay. And Joe, the nicest tree on this property is where you forced us to put the pond. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was waiting for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll do it. 
<laughs> so we might have to relook at that. <laughs> Maybe that's going back down the hill. What do you think? Uh, uh, that's not up to me. <laughs> so we're ready to go to public hearing. Yeah, I think it's, we can set the public hearing. Schedule a public hearing for uh, March 11. Okay. Yes. Make a motion. Yeah. Yeah. Make a motion we schedule a public hearing on Cobbling Rock for March 11th. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. See you. See you. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.